Edgewood Nebula. Hey folks, this is Lacey Hannon with the first episode of this season, Settle the Stars. Since its discovery by Galileo in 1610, the planet Mars has fueled the imaginations of countless writers of science fiction. From the pulpy fantasies of Edgar Rice Burroughs' Barsoom novels, to the eerily mirrored Americana of Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles, to the full-scale invasion of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, and Topps' Mars Attacks trading card series, we long dreamt of what horrors or wonders might await us on the second most habitable planet in our solar system. Turns out, it's mostly just rocks and a barely there atmosphere heavy in carbon dioxide. But that hasn't stopped us from wanting to get there and see it for ourselves. And public interest in the Red Planet has never been so high as the buzz that surrounded Andy Weir's science-driven space drama, The Martian. Set in the not-too-distant future of 2035, Andy Weir's novel concerns a crisis that befalls the third manned expedition to Mars. When an unanticipated windstorm wrecks havoc on the expedition team's ascent vehicle, they're forced to make a frenzied escape off the planet, leaving behind the habitat they'd set up for their research and one of their own they mistakenly believe to be dead. Mark Watney, the unluckiest botanist on two planets. In the aftermath of the storm, Watney wakes up to anyone's greatest nightmare. The realization his fellow astronauts have left him stranded on a desert planet with nothing to listen to but disco music. Where many would despair, the resilient botanist embarks on a remarkable journey to survive the roughly 400 days it will take a rescue effort to reach him from Earth. As thrilling as the dust jacket reads, the story behind how Weir's book came to the world's attention is a fascinating one in and of itself. Before his book found its way into the curriculums of both English and science classes across the U.S., Weir was simply a computer programmer who had grown up on the works of Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke and who aspired to write science fiction of his own. Perhaps owing to his parents' careers in particle physics and electrical engineering, not to mention his own career which allowed him to actually work out the orbital mechanics found in the Martian, Weir was driven to ground his fiction in science fact. He gained a modest following publishing his hard sci-fi stories online and eventually released The Martian in serialized form in 2011. His fans encouraged him to self-publish his book on Amazon Kindle, which he did for a grand sum of 99 cents per copy. And from there, his sales skyrocketed. A publishing company took notice and bought the rights, and it wasn't long before Hollywood saw the dollar signs printed in the stars. (laughs) Director Ridley Scott who had previously explored space through a more mm, fantastical lens with 1979's Alien and 2012's Prometheus, signed on to helm what would become the most hyped film of 2015. Matt Damon assumed the role of the wisecracking, space-stranded Mark Watney, and the likes of Jeff Daniels, Jessica Chastain, Sean Bean, Kristen Wiig, Chiwetel Ejiofor, Michael Pena, and Kate Mara rounded out an eclectic cast. The film was a major box office success a hit with the critics and audiences and yours truly alike. And it didn't do too shabbily when awards season came around either, scoring several nominations at the Oscars and even winning the Golden Globe Award for Best Picture, Musical, or Comedy. It's anyone's guess, though, whether they thought the film was supposed to be a musical or comedy, and if you have any idea, please let me know. I'd be curious. It's no surprise the big screen adaptation enjoyed the success it did. With the wildfire sales of Weir's New York Times bestselling book already fanning the flames of public interest, the film's marketing team drew upon the age-old strategy of blurring fiction and reality to get the water cooler conversation rolling. Video diaries were released of Damon Chastain and the rest of the Hermes crew going about routine astronaut business en route to Mars, and famed astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson even featured in a promo for the Hermes fictional flight that was perfectly indistinguishable from any other featurette wherein you would find him extrapolating on the wonders of space. Of course, the film would not have been the success it was had it not lived up to the marketing, and Ridley Scott, who was known for bringing a meticulous attention to detail to the worlds of his films, was the perfect choice of director for this hard sci-fi adventure. It was no challenge at all for Scott to enlist the aid of NASA in making the technology, the logistics, and the procedures of the film's stories as authentic as he could. 
To the contrary, NASA leapt at the chance to answer any and all questions the production team had and even visited the set to remark on the habitats and vehicles being constructed. So cool. Mars had already been a hot topic in the news for some time leading up to the filming of The Martian, with the presence of water detected there in 2008. And theories about Martian microbes piquing the interest of the public. A far cry from killer tripods, perhaps, but hey, possibility of life is still possibility of life. With the production and the release of The Martian, the world was suddenly abuzz with conversations about the prospects of actually getting people to Mars. And for NASA, an agency that operates in the public domain and receives its funding from Congress, public interest in space is always a good thing. When the first footage of The Martian was previewed, it was Jim Green, NASA's chief scientist and director of Planetary Science Division, and Dr. Charles Alachi of JPL, rather than any cast or crew who introduced the film. So, with all the attention to detail that went into making the film, and the fact that they were adapting a book packed with hard science by an author who had clearly done his research, just how accurate is The Martian in its depiction of our ruddy neighbor and the science involved in both getting there and surviving on its surface? Uh, pretty darn accurate, as it turns out. For starters, The Martian was filmed in the Wadi Rum protected area of southern Jordan, which bears remarkable similarity to the topography of Mars. This deserty UNESCO heritage site didn't earn the nickname Valley of the Moon for nothing. Previous science fiction films such as Mission to Mars, Red Planet, and The Last Days on Mars was also filmed there just for this reason. So the Martian definitely got the landscape right. As for how the Hermes crew are seen interacting with the planet's environment, well, Mars has only 11% of the Earth's mass and about 38% of the Earth's gravitational strength, which means people would move a whole lot more slowly on its surface and also would be able to move objects with half the energy we expend over here on our own globe. Of course, we don't see any of this reflected in the film because, as Ridley Scott explained, filmmakers haven't figured out a way to dramatize such a thing in characters' interactions with their environment. Something of the film's impact very likely would be lost if the focus had been getting Matt Damon to move at half speed in, you know, every scene. It's easy enough to suspend disbelief over the gravitational inaccuracy in favor of all The Martian does do right. We can probably chalk this one up alongside such artistic liberties as allowing the audience to hear an explosion in the vacuum of space. Something that also happens in this film, by the way. <laughs> Details such as the artificial gravity on board the Hermes spacecraft, the varying lengths of time it takes to reach Mars from Earth, the amount of resources and planning that goes into a launch, the varying windows of launch opportunity based upon planetary alignment, and even the 11th hour plan to slingshot the returning Hermes spacecraft around the Earth and use our planet's gravitational force to accelerate it back towards Mars were all reviewed and advised on by NASA and hold up under scientific scrutiny. Some of these details even help complicate matters for the unlucky protagonist when poor alignment between the Earth and Mars results in Watney's having to wait a further 414 days for rescue, rather than the 124 days it originally took the Hermes to get there. The science behind how Watney manages to survive for a total of 549 souls, that's about 564 days for those of us Earthside, actually holds up pretty well too. Inside the habitat, Watney finds a sealed package of whole and fresh potatoes NASA sent with the crew so they could celebrate Thanksgiving seeing as he's the greatest botanist on the planet at the moment. Ha ha. Watney devises a way to multiply his potatoes by slicing them up and starting his very own Martian garden. In attempting such, Watney faces two significant problems. One, a lack of water, and two, a lack of nutrients in the soil. To solve his first problem, Watney burns the remaining rocket fuel from the descent vehicle to isolate the hydrogen and produce the water he needs as one does when the power goes out and you haven't showered since the day before. For his second problem, Watney decides to beef up the nutrient-devoid Martian soil with his own poop and what he can salvage from his crewmate's use of the habitat toilet, as one does when you're about to do some gardening and you're not about to make a second trip to the nursery just because you forgot to pick up fertilizer. Incidentally, there actually is water to be found in and recovered from Martian soil, making Watney's eyebrow-singing experiment with the rocket fuel an unnecessary but most certainly theatrical exercise. More importantly, 
Martian soil is heavy with perchlorates, which are kind of salt that would make potatoes very difficult to grow and that could even potentially turn the spuds toxic. Weir was not aware of this fact when he wrote The Martian, but has since explained that you could easily wash the perchlorates out of the soil with your rocket fuel derived water and still be able to successfully farm on Mars' terrain as Watney does. Throughout the film, we see Watney passing the days eating his potatoes, listening to disco music for hours on end, recalling the tragic moment he ran out of ketchup. But what's never addressed is how Watney manages to hold up under the intense radiation that beats down on the surface of Mars. Weir includes a brief reference in his book to the astronaut's suit being lined with some new form of radiation shielding. The year is 2035 after all. But he admits he basically shrugged the problem off in the interest of telling an otherwise very realistic and very compelling story. Still, he noted that the radiation would be a serious problem for anyone making a prolonged stay on Mars. The atmosphere there is simply too thin to provide any form of protection. Even the astronauts who have visited the moon have never stayed for much more than three days at a time, let alone the 30 days stay planned by the Hermes crew or the 564 days endured in total by Watney. Using a radioisotope thermal generator loaded with plutonium-238 as a personal space heater surely would not have helped Watney in this regard, either. Matters of radiation aside, what just might be the film's greatest scientific inaccuracy doesn't actually have anything to do with how Watney gets himself out of his predicament, but rather how Watney and his crew get into it. The windstorm that forces the Hermes crew off the planet and throws a stray antenna into Watney's abdomen make for an incredibly dramatic sequence on film. It feels so real to us because it's a force of nature that is absolutely possible on Earth. Alas, the scene could never take place on the surface of Mars. Winds on Mars blow at 1 100th the speed of those on Earth. So, a 100 mile per hour wind on Mars would carry all the power of a fair breeze. It's highly improbable that the winds of Mars could cause anywhere near the amount of destruction we see in the film. It sure does make for a thrilling plot catalyst, however. One of the Martian's other more interesting yet equally far-fetched plot developments finds China's space agency, the CNSA, coming to the rescue when a rushed launch of supplies for Watney explodes mid-flight, leaving the team at the Johnson Space Center in Houston utterly dismayed. The CNSA's chief scientist learns of the failed launch attempt and Watney's situation and realizes his own agency has a rocket booster ready to launch that can help the Americans save their astronaut. To help them would mean revealing the secret technology his agency had developed. But it would also mean saving a life in a move that's marvelously affirming of the good in humanity. The CNSA decides to help the Americans. The trouble with this scenario is Congress passed a law in 2011 that explicitly prohibits NASA from collaborating with China in any way whatsoever, which would preclude NASA from receiving assistance from the Chinese in their efforts to get life-saving supplies to their astronaut. Still, this development in the film dramatizes a heretofore unseen collaboration between the Chinese and American space agencies. China is the only spacefaring nation that has to date been prohibited from joining the International Space Station. It's a very optimistic portrayal of global politics. A setting aside of competition and the need for secrecy for the sake of collaborating and thereby achieving more together for all of humanity. If science fiction is ultimately about looking to the future and deciding where we do or don't want to be as a civilization one day, then on that score, the Martian most definitely succeeds. So, having considered the science behind Andy Weir's vision of the loneliest disco party in history, would it be possible for someone to survive under the condition Watney finds himself in in The Martian? If you take into account the exposure to radiation on Mars, that would be a hard no. As Weir himself states, after spending that much time on Mars, even with some degree of radiation shielding in place, you'd get so much cancer the cancer would have cancer, end quote. But what if we imagine that one day, maybe not 2035, but one day, there might exist radiation shielding strong enough to sustain a person for upwards of 564 days on Mars and that circumstances other than an impossible windstorm would strand them there? Could Watney's experience as imagined by Weir really happen then? 
Once he gets back inside the habitat, the main challenge Watney finds himself up against is not having enough food to survive for long. A non-botanist would indeed find it a challenge to keep a potato garden going in nutrient-free Martian soil. But assuming you have Watney's skills and an appreciation for the versatility of the potato, we can slide this one into the definitely possible category. Then you would need to know where to find the Pathfinder spacecraft, which ended its mission in the Ares Vallis region of Mars, and be able to successfully hack its built-in computer system so you could communicate with NASA to coordinate a pickup. If you were selected for a month-long stay on Mars in the first place, we'll assume you've easily got this all in the bag. So, provided you have the radiation shielding you need and are reasonably down with disco music, Mark Watney's 564 days on Mars and subsequent survival is definitely very possible. The whole Iron Man thing, where he punctures the glove of his suit and propels himself towards the Hermes spacecraft like Wally with a fire extinguisher? Well, let's just say we're only alluded to that and left it no more than a joke in the book for a reason. Aside from its very few scientific improbabilities and its wanton disregard for the ban on NASA collaborating with China, The Martian proves an accomplished work of hard science fiction that stands out in a genre known for glaring inaccuracies and wild implausibilities. The film also marked an unparalleled collaboration between NASA and Hollywood in an effort to both thrill and encourage audiences regarding the future of space exploration. While the prospect of actually settling and living on Mars may be very, very far away, there are realistic hopes that NASA can put the first astronauts on the fourth rock from the sun by as soon as the early 2030s. Landing people on Mars, as we see in Weir's future of 2035, would greatly advance both our understanding of our celestial neighbor and our efforts to branch farther into the universe. Collaboration across the nations of the world, as we have seen already aboard the International Space Station, in our own reality and between China and the U.S. within the fictional near future of the Martian, is essential for us to continue to learn, develop, and grow both in our understanding of what lies beyond our little corner of the universe and in our understanding of ourselves and each other. To get there, we need only follow the advice Mark Watney himself gives upon his return to Earth. You just begin. You do the math. You solve one problem, and you solve the next one, and then the next. And if you solve enough problems, you get to come home. Thank you all for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's episode of Settle the Stars, take a gander at our YouTube show, The Synthesis. We do a deep dive on this beloved movie, and we have a lovely conversation with the legend himself, Andy Weir. Uh, We discussed his most recent book, Project Hail Mary. He is so lovely and you might enjoy it as much as we did in the meantime be sure to subscribe if you haven't already set all the stars is available on pretty much every podcasting platform and we're also mirroring our episodes on youtube at youtube.com slash edgeworks entertainment be sure to ring that bell so you know when there's a new episode we also have a patreon page at patreon.com slash edgeworks entertainment where you can get early episodes and other great rewards The support of listeners like you is what makes this show possible, and I am so grateful to the people who have already joined. Thank you all for listening, and as always, happy terraforming. Settle the Stars is a proud member of the Edrix Nebula, a collection of intriguing and informative podcasts from Edrix Entertainment. Edrix Nebula. Hey, Molly. Hey, Max. Do you know how bats can see in the dark? I don't know how bats can see in the dark. Do you know how hot it gets on Venus? I have no idea. Do you know how rockets go to space? No. But do you know how the moon was formed? No idea. Well, if you're curious about these things just like we are, tune in to our new show, The Scientific Melody, with Molly and Max every single Thursday, wherever you absorb your podcasts. And if you have a hard time remembering things just like us, we'll turn everything into a song for you. Our first episode is out February 24th. It's The Scientific Melody. It's The Scientific Melody. Edgeworks Nebula.